What is up guys, Doug Polk here and we're back for another episode of Poker Hands and today we're going to be taking a look at a hand from the 2009 World Series of Poker European main event and man this is a crazy hand, let's check it out. Andy Black with a 7 makes the call. Now Alex Krepchenko in the small blind with ace queen and he will come along. In the big blind, men win with four tray of clubs, he calls. Well, look at this table, Black, Kravchenko, men to master all next to each other. They all have made the main event final table. You know, we've had a lot of good preflop play lately on the channel for the videos we've looked at. This hand is not going to be one of them. And the action folds to Christian Harder in the cutoff, who decides to open up 8-6 off. Now, this is far too loose for the cutoff. I wouldn't mind mixing that into my button strategy, but come on, man. There's three players left. They could be pretty aggressive against you. Now, maybe he's raising this up because he thinks the big blind's a weak player, but you still don't want to be raising hands this bad. Now on the button, Andy Black has a decision to make with a 7, and while calling is kind of okay, he's in position, I'm not really that big of a fan of it. He's dominated by a lot of stronger aces, and additionally now if he gets squeezed, he's going to be in an extremely tough spot and probably just have to fold. I think if he wants to play this hand, he needs to come in for a 3-bet facing this open. Now to the small blind, he wakes up with ace-queen, and he has a clear as day squeeze, which he decides to not take for whatever reason, allowing both 8-6 off and a 7 off a chance to outflop him. And really guys, ace-queen in the small blind facing a cutoff open and a button call is a monster. You need a 3-bet and start to get some value with your strong hand. Also, you knock the big blind out, which is a pretty big advantage. Now over to the big blind, and Win looks down at 4-3 suited. And this hand can either call or 3-bet. I wouldn't mind seeing 3-bet with this hand from time to time to try and take down all of the action, all of the money curling in the middle, but calling is also a winning play, so you can really go either way. And frankly, of all of the decisions made in this hand, I probably like this decision the most. Okay, let's go ahead and take a flop. The flop is Trey 8-4, two pair for men win. Harder with top pair, Black and Kravchenko missed. Kravchenko and Win checked. Harder now. Harder likes top pair. With his pair of eights, that's 3,025. Andy Black with a seven with a raise to over 8,000. Well, and Andy Black couldn't sell that weak ace on the black market right now for a wooden nickel, but he's going to make a play for this pot. Kravchenko laid it down. Now with two pair, men win. And men, the master feeling a bit squeezed here. He's got to like those two pair, but he's looking at a bet and a raise in front of him. He shows us, and then he folds. He's disgusted he had to lay that down. So Harder now, with his pair of eights, makes the call for 5,025 more. The flop comes 8-4-3, and the action checks back to Christian Harder. At this point, he decides to bet with his top pair weak kicker, and I'm not a huge fan of this, particularly the fact he bet about 60% pot. If he gets action, top pair is not going to be that great of a hand, and he could easily be behind really any of the players if they flat with a mid-pocket pair, or if the big blind swapped some kind of, you know, maybe two pair kind of hand. So there's a lot of ways he could be behind here, and I wouldn't be looking to value bet. Now, if you want to bet a hand like this, it's not terrible. When you get called, you're going to be ahead on average, but at the same time, if you face a raise, you're going to be in a difficult spot. In general, it's a pretty good poker strategy, strategy to not bet with hands where if you get raised, it's going to get ugly. Anyway, now on the button, Andy Black has a7 with the ace of spades, and he decides to raise it up. While this isn't a terrible play, he has the ace of spades, so he can represent some, some flushes on different runouts, and additionally, he knows that no one else has the nut flush draw, I think on a four-way flop, this is a bit too loose. If he wants to mix in some bluffs, he could use a hand like ace two suited, or ace five suited, or six five suited, or seven five suited, or a flush draw, or a backdoor flush draw. And I guess while he does have the ace of spades for the backdoor nut flush draw, it's a lot worse because he needs two spades on a board that will have four spades, meaning it's going to be kind of obvious if he puts in a lot of action that he has the nut flush. So it's much better to have a two card backdoor, nut, backdoor flush draw than just a one card. But anyway, he does decide to make it 8,000. The small blind now has a clear fold. And now Wynn has a kind of interesting spot with 4-3 suited in the big blind. Now when you have bottom two in this spot, it's actually kind of good because now it's much less likely your opponent has a set. If the button calls an open and raises on a board like this, he's saying he either has a draw or a hand like pocket threes, pocket fours, or pocket eights. Well, because you have a four and a three, those hands are now heavily blocked, meaning that it's quite likely the button is bluffing. 
I think a pretty good strategy here in the big blind would be to play almost all of your hands that you want to play as a call, with either some draws or some strong hands like 4-3. Because if you re-raise, it's not a very good spot to be able to bluff, and then that would mean your calls are just draws. So 4-3 here is a clear spot to put in some money, and he somehow lets it go. That is simply just baffling. Now back over to Christian Harder, who's not going anywhere with top pair, and you can really see what different state of minds these players are in. Two pair, no good. Top pair, bad kicker. Let's see a turn. And he does decide to call. Let's take a turn. Turn card 10 of clubs. No help to Andy. He really needs something now. Harder checks. And Andy again is going to try to stay in control of this pot. Yeah, he'll bet with that weak ace, 15,005. That's the second bullet Black has fired in his bluff to the high heels mission. And of course, he hopes this bullet ends matters. No, it does not. Harder comes along. Harder will not yield. Andy Black cannot like it. The turn comes in offsuit 10, and Harder checks it over to Andy Black, who now has a pretty clear decision to check it back and give up. When you do raise the flop, you don't want to always fire the turn. You want to pick some hands to give up with, and A7 seems like one of the best candidates. Really, anything else is going to have a lot more equity against your opponent's range if you had like a hand like a straight draw or a flush draw, or even two over card instead of just one. These are all better hands to bluff with than A7. In fact, it's hard to think of many hands that could even possibly be worse to bluff with than A7 here. However, he does decide to fire out about 15,000, and the action's back over to Harder. Now, this is one of the reasons why I'm not a big fan of betting 8-6 on the flop. It's going to get really dicey on a bunch of different runouts, and this is going to eventually going to become a difficult spot. While calling here on the turn seems good, you're going to have to be able to play some rivers, and there's going to be a lot of tough spots for you. So I, do, I wouldn't mind seeing him let go here on the turn. Now, if he does have some reads on the way his opponent is playing, it can be a little more reasonable to call. But you do want to have a few hands fold the turn after you call the flop, or else your opponent can exploit you by value betting you mercilessly. Harder does decide to call here, though, and let's take a river. Two very determined poker players see a nine of spades on the river that misses Black. Harder's two eights are oh. best, and he checks again, and Andy Black moves all in. My goodness. The river comes a nine of spades, and Harder cannot be excited about that because now straights and flushes have gotten there, other than a couple of low straight draws like 6-5 suited or maybe 7-5 suited. So Harder checks over, and now Andy Black, if he's going to bluff anywhere, it's got to be the river. You have a blocker to the nut flush, a blocker to some straights, although that's not that relevant because his opponent's not going to have a straight draw very often. But you have some reasonably good blockers, and frankly, if you're going to fire the turn and get this river, it's time to go for it. So he jams, and now the action's back over to Harder. To be honest with you, I think this is a pretty easy fold. You can have tons of better hands, some flushes, some sets, some over pairs with a spade, a lot of other hands to call that are better than 8-6. But there might be some chance that he thinks Andy Black is just fucking with him, and if that's the case, he might want to put his foot down. In general, I would shy away from trying to make calls like this, because at the end of the day, your range is going to have a bunch of good hands, and it's going to be protected. But let's see what happens. Black intent on bluffing off all his chips, but frankly, I don't see how Harder can call here with those naked eights. And Harder doesn't have Black covered by that much. This is for almost all his chips, and he knows that. He's, that's probably why he's willing to risk it all with this bluff right here. I call. He calls. Good call. Called. And that will be the end of Andy Black's tournament. What a call, wow. and what a monumental blow up again for wow. Andy Black. Good call. Wow. It all came down to Harder's read on Black, who showed no weakness on any street. And men, the master wants to see what Andy Black was playing. Come on. And he seems more upset than Andy Black, who's just been busted. Wynn gets really angry after the hand, and it's kind of hard to blame him when he realizes how weak both of his opponent's holdings were. But I hope that rather than just getting angry, he tries to walk away with some newfound knowledge. In fact, I think a lot of times when players lose or things don't go their way, they blame luck or variance or other people, when in reality, you should look at the situation and think, wow, if players' ranges can be that wide, clearly my bottom two should have at least called on the flop. So while I think it might not have made much of a difference in his play moving forward, don't let that happen to you and learn from your mistakes. As always, I want to thank you guys for watching today's episode of Poker Hands, and make sure to subscribe to the channel to get updates for when new videos come out.